Welcome to Behind the Case Podcast, a podcast that focuses on navigating the challenges our clients face with divorce and family law in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. Behind the Case is brought to you by the Turner Monaghan Legal Team. With over 70 years of collective experience in divorce and family law, Together, Tyler Monahan, Keaton Monahan, Tina Campbell, and the Turner Monahan team will discuss real life cases, answer questions, and explore family law areas from divorce to child custody. Our goal is to clarify scenarios and demystify legal jargon, making the process less daunting and reminding you that you're not alone. So sit back and let's discuss what happens behind the case. Going through divorce anytime is nerve-wracking. It's, you know, that unknown that you don't know. So what is that person that's coming in to this absentee spouse trying to divorce them need to prepare? Like, what do they need to do to not be so overwhelmed? Well, I don't think it matters whether it's an absentee spouse or not. And I would say 10% of our cases have absentee spouses. The rest of 90% of the time, they're either around or they're found. I mean, that's just the way the world works, right? Everybody's on social media. It's hard to go off the grid, as they say nowadays. So I think that People need to understand that they're in an emotional, illogical, and irrational time. Anybody would be. I would be if I were in that situation. I've been blessed I'm not in that situation, but we attempt to try to make an emotional, irrational, logical time as calming as can be. So our job is not just to be your attorney and fight and yell and scream at the other side and argue in court. Our job is to also be the counselors and the advisors to say, okay, let's step back. Let's look at it. I always use the analogy, we are the navigators. They are the captains. If we uh, were the navigators and the captains of the ship and we ran it all our way, then our clients would have no say so on what happens. But being a navigator and a captain, I think it, having two of those, it allows us and the clients to get on the same page for us to make good decisions with them. Do you agree with that? Heather? I do agree. And I think what I always tell clients is that the divorce process and custody process is the most emotional time that they're probably ever going to have. It's a death of a marriage. So you're mourning that you are emotional about your children, but not only that, you also bring in property to it. So now you're talking about your money and your livelihood. So it's a very scary time for a lot of clients. I've had some of the most intelligent professionals that can carry on a conversation with another professional, just perfect regarding any topic. But when it comes to their divorce, they become very emotional. When your emotions become involved, common sense is out the door a lot of the times. And so what I tell my clients is you get to be emotional and you get to be upset about what you're going through. But just please reach out to your counselor, your attorney, to get advice on what your next step should be and how you should react to the other party in the lawsuit that is also very emotional, very stressed out, and very scared. So it does take a team of the attorney. It takes the the client to trust the attorney with their life, their children, and their money, but also to listen to like the calming voice of the attorney who is not emotionally involved. And we see things from a different viewpoint than the client does. And that's where we kind of all can come together if we can work together as a team. And and the second, what she's saying about coming together as a team, and then sometimes you've seen some of the you know best professionals be able to carry on conversations with other professionals, but when it comes to their divorce, they become almost incapable of doing that. Well, everybody needs to remember that us as attorneys, when we're speaking to another attorney, we are not going to be emotionally involved, and it's not our job to argue with them, and it's not our job to fight with them. So. Sometimes you hear the old saying, you know, I think my attorney might be friends with the other attorney or, or they might be helping the other attorney. That's not the case. But at really, at the end of the day, you want an attorney who is able to speak to the other attorney or attorneys to be able to try to get the best results possible. The infighting of two attorneys actually leads to more litigation and a lot of times a worse outcome. Sometimes Two attorneys can't see the force before the trees. And what Heather and I and Tina and Keaton and Dick and what our firm tries to do is we try to make sure that we stay even keel across the board and that we are professional to everybody. We are courteous. We attempt to do the best service that we can for our clients. And if we're unable to get things done by agreement, then as I said earlier, 
we go in and we have our hearing and that's where we fight. That's where we, and we express our position to the court, not to the other side. And also just to add to that, the more the attorneys fight and the more we're in court, the more it's going to cost the clients too. That's right. I know we mentioned, you know, you have 30 days after. If they were to come up, they could redo it. But, you know, I know there's a bleeding period. But how long is it this the worst going to take if the other person doesn't show up and they don't respond? And so what does that waiting time look like? The waiting time is all dependent upon how quickly you can actually get the proper service for the code, meaning the alternative service. So if you were able to get it done within 60 days, wonderful, you can get it done. If I had a magic wand, I would do that to every case, but we're at the mercy of the courts. So sometimes you can't get in there and get the motion that you need heard, or you can't get the order signed. So, I mean, it's hard to say how long it's going to take when there is a quote unquote absentee spouse that's involved. One topic that has been higher right now is definitely high net worth divorces. Have you had a case recently that maybe could share on a high net worth divorce, especially, I know we always get into the custody side of this. But there's so many people now that aren't having kids. Like, that's mm -hmm. the world today. <laughs> yeah. And so, but what does that divorce look like? Because I know it's a little bit different because now you're just dealing with your property and the money and retirement. And especially if you don't have kids, you probably have higher retirements and different assets there. So what does a case like that look like? And what should it come prepare for for a consultation? It doesn't look a lot different than any other divorce would look like, except for you know, the focus is different. If we're not focusing on many children, we're focusing only on assets. A lot of times there is a lot more discovery that is going to be had. And discovery is where the attorneys will send formal questions and requests to the other side that have to be answered or otherwise the court can compel the other side to answer these questions. So it does take a little bit more time and it is going to be more costly simply because people are trying to protect their assets, retirement, their money. And sometimes the divorces without the children that are, are truly really high asset, high net worth divorces can be even more contentious because they are trying to protect their property and their money and their future. Yeah, and, and there's also experts that get involved in that, which can be more costly, but the experts that are involved are to make sure that the due diligence is being done on the totality of the circumstances, meaning looking at it from a global perspective, you might have business experts that need to be involved to do a business evaluation. You may have real estate where you have to have real estate experts that are involved. There's also stock options. You may have to have a, a financial advisor who's involved to, to help you understand how certain restricted stock are gonna work and how they're gonna be you know, f calculated on when they're gonna come due and when you're able to exercise them. There's a whole lot of things that go into high net worth individuals and, and divorces. And that's something that uh, both myself, Heather and Tina, we've handled and that we have several clients that are like that right now. And we've worked with numerous experts, just about every expert you can imagine in the Dallas-Fort Worth, including the Austin area. And we even have some out in East Texas that we've worked with that can really do some good work on assisting to make sure that we get the best information that we can to our clients so then we can make an informed decision to try to get a case either settled or to get prepared to go to trial on it. And so all those experts, they're coming to you and you're gonna help them find them. It's not something they have to go out and research this people. Right, we have the experts. When I say we have them, we have knowledge of the experts, meaning we've used numerous experts in the past to be able to assist us on cases. So we would go to the experts that we trust, who we know who have done a good job, and who understand certain circumstances. There's different experts for each type of field that we may be dealing with. Like there's oil and gas experts, there's stock experts, there's business evaluation experts. I mean, it, there's real estate experts. It's across the board on experts. And we don't put any onus on our client to be able to locate somebody like that. That's our job to get that done and to sign an agreement with them. So anything they discuss with us is attorney client privilege. That's why we do it that way. I'd say a huge thing that we hear people asking is about real estate, like, because that's one of our biggest assets we're going to own. And what happens if I move out first? Like, that's what people are really afraid of. Like, can I move out and do I lose a house if I move out? Can I get it back? Am I entitled to any of it? So what does that real estate side of it look like when you're dealing with a high net worth divorce? Should they stay in the house? Can they move out of it if it's like a toxic relationship? Let's take a quick pause here. If you or someone you know 
is navigating divorce or family law matters in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, reach out to Turner Monahan for a free legal consultation. Call us at 817-332-4477 or visit us at tumolaw.com. That's T-U-M-O-L-A-W.com for a free legal consultation. Now let's get back to Behind the Case. There's two different sets. There's temporary use and then there's final use. Moving out, if you decide to move out and you don't have children involved, there is a chance that now you've acquiesced to the other party residing there and then you've probably found another place to live. That doesn't mean you're not gonna get support or that you're not gonna have the ability to live somewhere else, but it doesn't mean that you lose the house. So when you acquire anything during marriage, no matter what, it is presumed to be community property until proven otherwise. It's, you have to rebut the presumption that it's not community property. So that's real estate, cars, anything, but it's real estate specifically, you're not going to lose value. It's not like because you moved out, now they've been paying for it, they get more of a share or anything like that because it's still community. They owe a duty and an obligation to the estate and to the other spouse, so do you, to make sure things get paid and that you don't waste and you don't get rid of things. And that's why injunctions and things of that nature come into play in regards to real estate and other things of that nature. Right. Heather, can you think of anything on the real estate front? Well, I do have clients ask, you know, because I moved out, now have I abandoned the house? They hear that from their friends or family. And no, you have not. You have not abandoned your house. I mean, not abandoned your share of the equity in the house. You're still going to be awarded your share of the equity from the house and the divorce. If you do have children, then it's a whole different story about whether you move out of the house or not. Mm -hmm. Because if they're children in the house and they're in school, especially, the children are the one aspect that the court doesn't want to change during the divorce. And they want to keep at least some stability for the kids while their parents are, are divorcing. And so if one parent stays in the house and is taking care of the kids on a daily basis, then in that situation, that parent is probably going to be awarded the house. I mean, so, and primary custody of the children, most likely. I mean, and that's not a given on everything, but it, it, it definitely is a, a point in their favor. Heather, would you say that there is a major difference between a divorce with children and without children? Yes, I would, because... Even in a high net worth, you could still have children. And the children put another another element into the divorce. And with that, it causes even more emotions. There's still going to be a lot of fights about money, how much support should be paid, both to the spouse and to the children. So, uh, yes, I would say that there is a big difference. Yeah. It, so I see in the cases that we handle that when there are children involved, it adds another aspect of what they're going to argue about because sometimes you'll have somebody who starts off with they're thinking about the financial stuff because they're hiding that wealth individual but then out of nowhere all of a sudden well wait wait but i want my children to live here and now that's the most important thing to me when they find out the other spouse says well the children are going to live with me so it's like a tit for tad situation that's why i think that when you have children involved it adds an extra layer that changes the emotional level of the way that the case proceeds and from what I've seen, you end up going to court on a temporary basis unless you're able to get an agreement with opposing counsel or with the opposing party. You end up going to court because the people want to know where the children are going to live, wh who's going to pay for them, where are they going to go to school, things of that nature. And that goes along with the house because you might have one spouse. You might have the spouse who left the home because it was a situation where it was untenable and they went and took their children to their parents or maybe to another place, but they want to get back into the house. Well, that's going to require going to court to say, hey, look, I should be here, and this is why, and then the other spouse would have to move out. So that kind of goes back to the question you were saying. So just because you leave your house doesn't mean you can't get back in. But if that is the case, you need to file for divorce. You need to contact an attorney. If you want to file for divorce, file for divorce quickly and get into court so it's not a long period of time where you've what I call acquiesce to the circumstances. Do you agree with that? I do agree. Yeah. Look at the high net worth side of it. Bank accounts that are offshore. How does that come into play with it? And I think a lot of people are like, which money do I have to disclose? And is there any money I don't need to disclose? Like that's my money. That's not Tom. That's hard. It's harder to get those accounts. 
But what we do have access to is all the accounts here in the United States. Those are easier to get. And money is not just magically floating away into these offshore accounts. It's coming out of accounts here in the United States that have been transferred over there, whether it's a bank account, Venmo, Zelle, any other. There's all these apps that people are paying. They're transferring money to different accounts, offshores. We can get those records, and that shows that money has been moved to an offshore account that may be more difficult to get, which in turn will cost the client that needs the information on the offshore accounts just more money on subpoenas and things like that. But there's what we call tracing, that we can figure out where this money came from. Which involves experts. Exactly. And so we can figure out where this money went to and how much the other party's entitled to. And I'm very kind of straightforward, logical guy. My wife tells me I'm too logical sometimes. But I have never found to this day, I wish I would have or could have, I've never found a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow nor the leprechaun. We get told all the time there's there's money hidden. It's hidden. It's somewhere. It's somewhere. Attorneys can't find that money if that money was never somewhere that we could then trace it. If you have a good attorney who understands how tracing works and where to go look for assets if they've moved out of a certain account that you have access to, then you can possibly find that offshore account or see that there was money in here and now it's gone. We may not know where it is, but you can use a term that you're able to use under the family code, which is called reconstitution of the estate, which you can say, hey, look, we know that 500,000 was in there. It disappeared. We don't know where it went, but we see that it's in there. And we know that one client or the other had no access and could have never made it disappear. And in those cases, we can reconstitute the estate and then we can go forward with utilizing experts to possibly trace it. And if we can't find it, use that expert to reconstitute the estate and say, this is where the estate would be if that 500,000 were, were actually in the estate. Here's where it'd be today. Because we have, I, and I know Heather, we've actually had circumstances like that where we know the money was there. We just can't find where it went. But then that's when there's other things that you can do that come into play that the family code allows you to utilize to be able to prove. I'm going to be a little unbiased here real quick. I know you have a finance degree prior to becoming an attorney. Do you think that really gives you an edge on being able to locate some of that finance stuff a little better and understanding where the numbers are going by seeing those reports? I don't have a finance degree, but what I do have, I do have a business degree. Most attorneys have, you know, either psychology or, or social studies or something of that nature. But I worked in the, in the financial world and I used to have my, I've done my CFP stuff and I went to Rice University to do some graduate work. And then I also worked for World Bank of Canada in the financial markets, which dealt with everything from taking people public all the way down to your, your lowly stocks and bonds and life insurance stuff. So I have been well-versed in that. I did that over 25 years ago is when I started doing that. So I've always kept up with that type of stuff and I understand those things. So I don't know that it helps with us locating assets. But when somebody comes to us, whether it's to, to the firm, whether it's Heather is working on the case, I'm working on the case, Tina's working on the case, we all get together and discuss things like that. And I think that each one of us bring to a table a different aspect. And I think that I can bring in kind of that financial side to say, well, hey, have we thought about this? Because this could have happened here which might mean this is over here. And then sometimes we're able to figure things out when we have a situation where it's financially motivated. So if somebody's listening that's in the DFW area and you know is wanting to file a divorce of this type or any divorce or child custody case, how do they reach out to you? First thing, you can go absolutely call us on our phone, which is 817-332-4477, same number we've had for about 15 years now. And you can go to our website, which is tumolaw.com. That's T-U-M-O-L-A-W.com. We have a lot of information there. But the best thing to do is call. Call in, set a time to chat. A lot of times at our firm, when you call in, you're going to get to talk to somebody right then and there. There's either generally attorney available or there's a paralegal available to at least get some of the cursory information that we need, get you some information, and then when you're ready to proceed forward, we can really hone down and, and burrow down on exactly what needs to be done. We're pausing our deep dive into today's topic, but the discussion isn't over. Join us in the next part of this episode as we continue to unravel the complexities behind the case. 
If our conversation today sparked questions or you're seeking further insight, consider subscribing and sharing our podcast. If you are in the DFW area and facing a divorce or family law situation, contact our attorneys today at 817-332-4477 or online at tumolaw.com. That's T-U-M-O-L-A-W.com for a free legal consultation. Navigating legal challenges can be daunting, but with the right support, clarity is within reach. Stay tuned as we continue this conversation on the next episode. Please note that the information provided in this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not intended as legal advice. Listening to this podcast or contacting our team does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. For advice on your specific situation, please consult with a licensed attorney in your area.